hello again. This is Michael Kreutz, and this is the second lecture in this series for the INT Lattice Summer School. Now today's talk is going to be about chiral symmetry and some of the important things it teaches us about non-perturbative QCD. So the lattice is going to play a very minor role in this thing, but it will come back in the next couple of lectures because of the interplay of chiral symmetry with the uh, well, the lattice is very interesting, very rich. So let me go to the slides. Okay, so it, it, by the end of this slide, uh, the lecture, you should know what these pictures here are at the beginning. They're just taken out of it. So there are two powerful tools for non perturbative strong interactions. One, of course, is the lattice, which is the main thing of this school. It's very rigorous. It's a way of defining the field theory, but it is extremely computationally demanding. The other tool we've had for a long time is chiral symmetry. This is an expansion in the quark masses and momenta, and it gives a very nice qualitative description of a lot of low energy physics. But because it is a symmetry of the theory, it provides some very nice checks on the lattice ideas. So, to get started, let's take our quark fields, which I'll call just psi here, and project out right and left-handed components of them. And look at the kinetic term for in the Lagrangian, psi where d slash psi, which in, in the continuum, naive continuum theory, breaks up into something involving right-handed fields and something involving left-handed fields, with no mixing of the two. The mass term does mix them. The mass is a combination of the left with the right and the right with the left. So the point is that if you don't have a mass in the theory, the left and right-handed fields appear to be completely independent. There's no interaction of the two of them. Now this symmetry is, as we know, broken in several ways, and th three different ways are, are fairly obvious. First. There's a spontaneous breaking. The psi bar psi itself gets an expectation value. This is the left with the right and plus the right with the left. Uh, and this is very important to understanding the lightness of the pions, and we'll get into that. Uh, there's also an implicit breaking of a U1 symmetry by the anomaly, and this is supposed to explain why the eta prime meson is not as light as the other pseudoscalars. Uh, <coughs> There's also an explicit breaking from the quark masses, and which is why pions are not exactly massless. There's a really rich physics from the interplay of these three effects, and that's what the discussion here is all about. <coughs> so what do anomalies and spontaneously broken symmetries have in common? The first are not symmetries, but you don't know it. The second are symmetries, but you don't know it. So they don't have anything in common. But you don't know it. I stole this slide from a CP3 origins seminar a few years ago. <clears throat> now these are really old ideas. Way back in 1971, Dashen argued that CP violation could, could be spontaneously broken in the strong interactions. And we will see as we proceed how that can happen. And this is even before QCD, which is pretty amazing. Uh, in the mid-70s, Tuft showed that there was a very close connection between the anomaly and the topology of the gauge fields, the instantons and stuff. The uh, Fujikawa in 79 showed a very nice way to understand the anomaly was through the fermion measure. <coughs> uh, Witten, around 1980, showed that there was a really nice connection with Carol Lagrangians, which is the main thing I'll be talking about here. <coughs> So, <coughs> consider QCD with NF light quarks, and I'm going to assume that these things are degenerate for the, most of this discussion here, and make the usual assumptions that QCD makes sense as a field theory, uh, that there will be this spontaneous symmetry breaking that psi bar psi is not vanishing, uh, which leads to the SUNF cross SUNF standard chiral perturbation theory. And I will assume that the anomaly is actually what does give the eta prime its mass. And for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to assume I don't have too many flavors to get into any of these conformal phases, which you'll probably hear about in some of the other lectures. 
So I'm thinking of two or three flavors for the majority of this talk. Uh, I'm going to use continuum language here, but there's an underlying assumption that there is a non-perturbative regulator in place, which could be the lattice. But for this discussion, let's assume that the uh, momentum space cutoff is much larger than lambda QCD, uh, or in lattice language, the lattice spacing is much smaller than 1 over lambda QCD. So now let's imagine constructing an effective potential for our meson fields. Now the effective potential is defined as what the vacuum energy would be if you force the field to have a certain expectation value. And this can be done formally by a Jonder transformation. For a nice discussion of this, see Coleman's book of, of its lectures. Uh, and I'm going to assume that my regulator, whatever I'm using, uh, allows me to define some composite fields like psi bar psi. For simplicity, I'm going to initially consider the quarks all to be degenerate with a common small mass. And I'm going to consider an even number of flavors for now. There are interesting subtleties which you'll see towards the end when NF is odd. So I'm going to be discussing things in terms of some composite fields. There's the sigma field, which is just psi bar psi, which is proportional to the mass term. Uh, then I've got our, my pion field, psi bar lambda alpha gamma phi psi, where these uh, lambdas are the Gelman matrices, or for two flavors, these would just be the poly matrices. Uh, and then there, there's going to be a gauge singlet common uh, pseudo scalar, I mean, not gauge, uh, flavor singlet eta prime, which is I psi bar gamma phi psi. So we start off with the idea that there's a spontaneous symmetry breaking when the quarks are massless. In other words, this V as a function of the sigma field has a double well structure. Um, now, for the, the, this purpose, I'm going to ignore convexity issues. It turns out when you formally define a vector potential, it has to be a convex function. And the reason is, if you try to hold the field at somewhere in the middle here, the vacuum will just split up into part of it in this minimum, part of it in that minimum. So formally, this should be flat. But we're all used to this in discussions of the Higgs, etc. So I'm going to ignore that issue as understood. Now the massless theory is supposed to be symmetric under flavored chiral rotations. So if I take psi and do some kind of a chiral rotation, either the I, some angle, gamma 5 times one of these Gelman matrices on psi, this is just supposed to be a change of variables. And I could redefine the theory using this variable instead of the other one. Uh, so for two flavors, this is sort of replacing the sigma field with a mixture of the sigma field and the pion. <coughs> and the pion is a mixture of the self and the sigma. <coughs> Oops. Anyway, the effective potential should be symmetric under this rotation. This means that a potential has the number of flavors squared minus one, which is the number of generators for the symmetry group, flat directions, one for each generator. So if we look at the effective potential in the sigma and one of the pi component directions, it should be flat. It shouldn't matter where I am on this circle. And you see that if I sit my, put my vacuum right here and look at excitations, little wiggles in the pi field, uh, in the pi direction, they don't cause you any energy. And that is why the pions are massless in the chiral limit. <coughs> <clears throat> now, of course, the quarks have small mass, and what the small mass does is it selects a vacuum. It puts a little tilt on my potential. This is the blue line here. Uh, and which forces, it, which selects a particular direction for the vacuum expectation value. And so here we have selected <coughs> the, the uh, be in the positive sigma direction. And then the plants are not quite massless. They get a mass proportional to the square root of this uh, tilting. Now, this is a very nice concept conceptual thing. You can the idea is the vacuum is not empty; it's full of this sigma field, and the pions are in fact waves on this sigma background, and that's why they're massless. They're very light. <coughs> now, there's an anomaly in the theory. 
if it means if I try to rotate between the sigma field and the eta prime direction, it's not supposed to be symmetric. So it takes psi goes to e to the i, phi gamma phi psi, without any gamma on matrices in there. And you mix the sigma and the eta prime, and the eta prime, because the mixture of the sigma and the eta prime. Oops. <coughs> Near the vacuum state, the sigma is around V, and eta prime is around zero, but the excitations around this are not supposed to be massless. The effective potential if I expand around that point is the mass of the sigma field times the distance from the vacuum. And then the eta prime is supposed to have a larger mass, which is coming from the anomaly, and we'll discuss how that works. Uh, both masses are of order lambda QCD, so they don't go to zero as the pion mass, as the quark mass goes to zero. So in quark language, <coughs> the fact that the D is in the continuum limit is supposed to anti-commute with uh, the Dirac uh, kinetic term means that this should be a symmetry. E to the I, some phase, a, phase angle to gamma 5 over 2 psi, <coughs> and psi bar going in the same way, <coughs> mixes the sigma and the eta prime. So the sigma would go to this, the eta prime would go to this. But this symmetry is not a real symmetry. It's an anomalous one in the sense that any valid regulator must break it. Well, Fujikawa shown, uh, presented a very nice way to understand this. He argued that this change of variables actually alters the fermion measure. So the integral d psi becomes the integral d psi times the determinant of the phase that you've multiplied it by. And the determinant of a matrix is either the trace of the log of the matrix. So it says e to the i phi trace gamma five d psi. But wait a minute, trace gamma five is supposed to vanish, right? It's just a little four by four matrix. And the whole point is that in the regulated theory, this must be violated somehow. So for instance, <coughs> let's imagine trying to define the trace of gamma five with some kind of cutoff in it. So we're going to take a, so, and unfortunately I use the same lambda as I did for lambda QC. No, this is a different thing. This is your, a cutoff of some sort. As the cutoff goes to infinity, we define the trace of gamma, D is gamma five to be the trace of gamma five times e to the minus some smoothing function. So for the smoothing function, we're going to use the kinetic term for the quarks, so d squared over lambda squared. So in the, formally, in the limit lambda goes to infinity, this factor doesn't do anything, but when we've got a regulator, it's, it's still there. So let's def use the eigenstates of the Dirac operator to define the trace of gamma 5. V of gamma 5 is, uh, these are the eigenstates, uh, and so we define the trace to be the sum over all these eigenstates. And then we'd leave this little cutoff in there, either lambda squared over lambda squared. Oh dear, that's another confusion. These are both lambda. <laughs> uh, so it turns out that this idea of summing over the eigenvalues is brings in the connection with topology and the index theorem. So let's assume that in our configurations, we're going to require the f mu to go to van vanish at spatial infinity, just a boundary condition. That means that a mu does not itself have to vanish, it has to go to a pure gauge con uh, configuration at, at spatial infinity. So this pure gauge thing is, that is a, some group element times the d mu of that group element. And now for SU2, this is a group element in SU2, and it's a uh, an SU2 element, that you'll probably hear a lot about in these lectures, is some A0 plus IA vector dot sigma with A mu squared equals 1. So infinity and the group space are both three spheres. This is a three sphere, and so is the spatial infinity, space time infinity. <coughs> so this function here can wrap non trivially around the group, even though F mu goes to zero at infinity. This defines a winding number, how many times this H wraps around the group as a wrap around spatial infinity. And it gives you a winding number, which we will call nu, for any gauge field. Now the instanton is a particular example of a winding number one configuration. It's uh, A mu just takes the simple form x squared over x squared plus rho squared times e mu h 
through H. And if I take H, which explicitly wraps around the infinity uh, at, at the infinite boundary, this quantity, it, this is, I'm talking about the group SU2 here, there's a parameter here which is the instanton size. This, in fact, minimizes the action with a given winding number, winding number one. And it gives you a classical solution of the Angle's equations. So we know that this non-trivial mapping can occur, because here's a configuration which does it. Now, for general SUN, you can, gen uh, you can general, uh, it's just using the SU2 subgroups. Now, there's a theorem on the Dirac operator that with a winding new, D must have zero modes. Be configu uh, configurations of the psi fields on which D vanishes. And these modes are chiral. And the reason they're chiral is because D anti commutes with uh, gamma 5, and if, if uh, it can be simultaneously diagonalized with gamma 5. Anyway, the, these modes are all either positive or negative chirality. And the difference between the negative and positive eigenvalues is this winding number. So that's the index theorem. There must be zero modes of the Dirac operator in the continuum here. Now, the non-zero eigenvalues are always in chiral pairs. If uh, d on 1 is some lambda on, on that side, then d on gamma 5 of psi will have the opposite sign. Uh, which means that uh, these, all the eigenvalues which are non-zero cancel out when I'm trying to calculate trace of gamma 5. But the zero modes don't. The trace of gamma 5 is the sum over the, all the modes and zero modes. There's been some right-handed ones and some left-handed ones, and the re result is the winding number. Now, why is this important? Well, first of all, where do the opposite chirality states go? I mean, naively, the trace of gamma 5 vanishes. Well, in the continuum cutoffs, this, the, they're kind of lost in infinity. They're all above the cutoff, and so we, we ignore them. With the Wilson-Dirac operator, which I'll discuss in my next lecture, the real eigenvalues are in a region where there are doubler particles. With the overlap operator, which again we'll come to later, modes are there, but they're just across the unitarity circle. So the, if d gamma 5 is in, in the, with the overlap, there's this, this symmetry that if I do, try to take gamma 5 through it, it doesn't come back as itself, it comes back as a different operator gamma 5 hat, which is n not traceless. <clears throat> now, it's important to realize that this phenomenon involves both short and long distances. There's the modes above the cutoff, and then there's the very the zero modes. Uh, if all the modes are paired somehow, they're just lost to the cutoff. Which means the perturbative and non-perturbative effects get rather intricately entangled. Uh, as you vary your lattice spacing, a little instanton can get lost. And so if the lattice spacing is bigger, they can fall through the lattice. And how this works, how you count the winding number on the lattice, depends on the details of your lattice scheme and your scale. So at this point, you should be terribly confused. So I will pause for a moment, and you can let this information sink in. This looks so much like so many of the graphs we see from uh, LHC experiments. Okay, so let's go back to this effective field language we had at the beginning. Uh, we started off with the fact that there would be two minima in the sigma and the eta plane. There's the two minima in the sigma direction. Uh, and uh, th these two minima are giving a plus or minus effect v, that expectation value to sigma. So an obvious question is, do we know anything else about this potential? And I'm going to now argue that there are actually other minima, too, and they're equivalent. So back to our left and right-handed breakdown of the theory. If we try to rotate only the left-handed guys, which would be a chiral rotation, this is not supposed to be a good symmetry for generic angles. Uh, however, a flavored rotations, psi L going to G, some group element in the flavor group times psi L should, should be a good symmetry. And so this is difference from this phase factor by having a Gaumann matrix in there. 
So this is a symmetry for GL in S U N F. And because it, it's a symmetry because the trace of the Gelman matrices really do vanish. Mm. Now for special discrete values of this angle, these two rotations can cross each other. So uh, an S U uh, a, a, a a G, which is of the form either the 2 pi over the number of flavors, is in ZNF, which is a subgroup of SUNF. So this is a valid discrete symmetry. If I pick this particular angle, take sigma and mix it with the eta prime, uh, and the eta prime and mix it with the sigma, uh, by a, this specific discrete angle, that should be a valid symmetry. So this potential actually has a ZN symmetry with N flavors. Uh, there are NF equivalent minima in the sigma eta prime plane. So for example, with four flavors, I could have the four minima. And this is an attempt to try and sketch that, but that didn't work so well. So at the Carol Lagrangian level, Zn is a subgroup of both Sun and U1, so therefore it's a valid symmetry. At the quark level, the measure gets a contribution from each flavor. And so if I give each flavor a factor of either 2 pi i over nf, then I put them all together, I get a, either 2 pi i, which is a valid symmetry. Now, we talked at the beginning about the, the mass tilting the effective potential. And as it tilts, it depicts one minimum as the best, the lowest. In the nth minimum, these things become either metastable or unstable, depending on how far up they are in the, this circle of minima. Uh, and there are multiple metastable minima whenever an f is greater than 4. Now let's, wait, we talked before about the mass terms tilting the potential, but now let's p tilt the potential in a different direction. Let's not tilt it in the sigma direction, but let's tilt, tilt it somewhere in between the sigma and eta direction. So I think M, what would normally be M psi bar psi, and, and take a tilt in a mixture of these two directions. This gives a different theory. It's a different theory because the original theory was tilting this way, and this is tilting in some other direction. And what's kind of interesting, at least if the quark masses are small enough, as we increase this tilt, this angle, this minimum will stop to be the lowest one, and if we tilt more than pi over 4 here, uh, this will become the minimum. There's a discrete jump in the vacuum between different minima. This angle of rotation is the strong CP parameter theta. I've done given each flavor the same phase, so the conventional notation has theta being nf times the uh, angle I've talked about. The ZNF symmetry implies a 2 pi periodicity in theta. And the fact that there's a jump between these two minima oops, shows that there is a, with degenerate life quarks, there must be a first order transition at theta of pi. Uh, and that's pretty nice. We've proven it without any complicated math here anywhere. It's an amazing thing. Furthermore, there's a discrete symmetry in the mass parameter. If I take the mass and tilt it into some funny angle, uh, if I make that angle be a multiple of 1 over nf, they, you get an equivalent theory. So I, for four flavors, I could consider m psi bar psi as my mass term, or I could just as well consider i m psi bar gamma phi psi as a mass term. And they'll be completely equivalent in terms of the physics. However, this equivalent is true if and only if nf is a multiple of 4 because that's when we get the fourfold symmetry. <coughs> okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about an odd number of flavors, uh, and if it's 2n plus 1. Minus 1 is not an element of SU of an odd number. 
This means that a positive mass theory and a negative mass theory are not equivalent. I can't rotate m into minus m. And in fact, m less than zero represents theta equals pi, which is an inequivalent theory. And uh, at theta pi, I've already argued that there's a sudden jump. You're right on the transition. And that transition is basically a spontaneous CP violation. So here's three flavors. There's three minima. Oops, I keep hitting the wrong button. Uh, and for positive mass, you get your usual thing here. But if I try to tilt it to the left, I've got two possibilities for my vacuum. And so the theory spontaneously will pick one or the other, and there'll be a spontaneous CP violation in three flavor QCD with a negative mass. And then the eta prime has an expectation value, so it is actually a CP violating phase. Now, in perturbation theory, the sign of the mass is really irrelevant. If I have, so here's a fermion line and a vertex is connected to, I can take a gamma phi rotation on it and flip the sign of the mass. So in perturbation theory, it doesn't see theta. Theta is totally non-perturbative. And so we see now that three flavor QCD with a positive mass and three flavor QCD with a negative mass have identical perturbative expansions but they're different physical theories, which is a really remarkable thing here. So we talked about odd numbers. Well, a nice odd number is one. And this is one of my favorite theories, because you go down to one flavor, there's no chiral symmetry at all. There's only one minimum. In this minimum, cyber side does get an expectation value, but it's not from spontaneous symmetry breaking. It's from something which is called the Tuch vertex which I may get into. I'm not sure if I'll get into that in these talks. Uh, so one flavor of QCD has a mass up here. And if I make the mass be a little bit negative, I don't have any first order phase transition at theta of pi until I get to fairly large values, which we'll talk about later. OK, so what are we doing? One flavor of QCD does not have any singularity at m equals 0. And so there is no symmetry protection of a massless quark. This is sometimes called a renormalon ambiguity. Uh, for small mass, there is no first order transition at theta of pi. We'll go into this in great detail in later lectures. So to summarize what's in this talk, QCD with NF mass massless flavors has a very nice flavor singlet discrete ZNF chiral symmetry. Uh, the f there's a first order transition at theta of pi whenever the quark masses are not vanishing. So you turn on a little bit of quark mass and you get this first order transition. The sign of the mass is significant for an odd number of flavors. This is not seen in perturbation theory. There is no symmetry for NF equals 1, and so the massless quark is unprotected. I will return to all of these issues in the last lecture. So thank you all, and we'll talk to you later. And I do. Really